Welcome in, friends. This is Jason Elam. I am so excited about today's episode. Our guest is the incredible Brad Jerzak. Brad is an author, speaker, and former church planter. He's the editor-in-chief of CWR Magazine, is on the faculty of the Institute for Religion, Peace, and Justice, and is associate dean of the Master of Ministry program at St. Stephen's University. His books include Can You Hear Me? Tuning In to the God Who Speaks, Her Gates Will Never Be Shut, Hope, Hell, and the New Jerusalem, and A More Christ-Like God, A More Beautiful Gospel. He has also authored two children's books, Children, Can You Hear Me? and Jesus Showed Us. The guys at the Nomad Podcast say he is the kindest man they have ever met, and several other podcasters have told me privately that Brad is one of their favorite guests to interview, and I am thrilled to welcome him to the Messy Spirituality Podcast today. Welcome, Brad Jerzak. Thanks for having me. I, I like the sounds of that guy you were talking about. I don't recognize him, <laughs> but you know, I guess I repress some of my uh, my messiness enough to fool the nomad guys. They're fantastic. I'm glad you have a connection with them. They really are wonderful. And they were so gracious talking about you and uh, the times that you've been on there and the response they've gotten from there, uh, from those interviews. And also many other podcasters, Seth Price at the Can I Say This at Church podcast just raves about you as an interview. And uh, so I'm grateful for your time here today. I appreciate being on. It's good to be with you. Uh, Brad, tell us a little bit about you and your faith journey. Wow. So that's uh, because I'm 55 years old. Uh, that's a long story. So we'll just compact it. Let's see. For 20 years, I was with the Baptist Church. I grew up a dispensationalist, quite hardcore, a cessationist, meaning we didn't really believe that God works in miraculous ways or mystical ways or any of that stuff. But I will say that my parents uh, kept my heart open and they didn't drink all the Kool-Aid I was willing to drink. And so um, I walked out, I moved on from the Baptist church with a great appreciation for prayer, for the Bible, for sharing the good news of Jesus. And and uh, that is unchanged to this day, although maybe it takes different forms. Um, after I did my, I did, I did a biblical studies degrees, um, uh, my wife and I moved out west, and I joined the Mennonite church for 10 years. I was ordained as a minister there, and they really gave me the gift of, of having a Christocentric or Christ-centered approach or interpretation of Scripture, and it was like in, incredibly this immense immersion in the four Gospels for the next 10 years. That's also where um, I was working in youth ministry with a lot of broken people, like severely broken um, victims of childhood sexual abuse, molestation, all that. And that opened a door to learning about inner healing. And so it was even while we were with the Mennonite church that we got to know people in their inner healing movement. And then I opened up more to sort of charismatic renewal stuff. Um, fairly healthy version of that. We had influence from the, the Langley Vineyard down the road. After 10 years of that, we sensed a call to church planting. So my wife and I and another couple, Brian and Sue West, planted a little church called Fresh Wind. I co-led that with Brian to begin with, and then he left, and I, I was pastor for 10 years there. In 2008, well, and I'll say that we thought that was going to be like a charismatic church for Gen Xers. <laughs> it was, we were totally wrong. It ended up being a place for people with disabilities, children, addicts, prodigals, the poor, and uh, we got to see how Christ works on the margins up front and close. And it was just, it was one of the best experiences of my life. Um, but in 2008, I had a big crash because of a, a great series of tragedies that in, in our church due to the nature of the place. And um, I really, for the first time, didn't trust Jesus. And I knew it. I'm like, well, I can't lead us through this. If I don't trust Jesus, I've never had this experience before. And so I didn't do deconstruction. It was, I underwent it. Um, the bulldozer of life came over me. And happily, my wife stepped in uh, at the request of the elders, and she led the church for the next five years as a, a real healer and a mom. Like She's like, she's like um, a white version of Abba in the shack <laughs> of Pop Papa. And uh, it really worked for the church. And that's when I went and did my PhD stuff. Meanwhile, I'm connecting with these guys from the Orthodox monastery uh, nearby, these old, these monks, and and really um, a lot of the unraveling, the deconstruction I went through, um, 
when it came time to reconstruction, it looked like the Orthodox faith. And I, I, I needed their theology of a non-retributive God, a God who is mercy only. And I needed the liturgy as a therapy for kind of the stresses that revivalism put you through. Uh, so that's where I'm at today. Um, I, I connect with all these streams. I actually barely ever speak in, in Orthodox churches except the monastery. So really, when I do itinerant stuff and the people I'm, I have in this, at school with me, um, these, are, these are typically folks who've come out of evangelicalism and are, are looking to, for a more beautiful gospel. So I think that kind of summarizes 55 years in a reductive way. <laughs> <laughs> you've, you've gotten that down to a very good elevator pitch. Good job. Working on it. <laughs> you mentioned working with the broken, the addicted, the disabled at Fresh Wind. Yeah. And right. uh, that fascinated me. I hear that talked about, I hear you bring that up in interviews on lots of podcasts, but I'd really like to dive into that if we can. I'd love to. What was that season of life like? What do you mean by inner healing when you talk about that? And what did those experiences of working with the broken, the addicted, and the disabled teach you about humanity, teach you about God, teach you about yourself? Oh, is that all you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I'll divide it up maybe to begin with between the, the, the broken where we were doing inner healing work and then like the disabled folks, which like literally disabled um, in full-time care. It's really two seasons of life that ended up congealing. So the first thing was I, um, in terms of inner healing, it began very, very simply with young people coming to like for the first time to our youth group, and I was trying to keep the gospel simple. And I would say things this simple, God loves you. <laughs> you know, here's what you need to know, God loves you. And if you want to know what that love looks like, let's look at Jesus and how he treated people. Well, you can't even say such a simple thing to somebody who's been molested as a child without them saying, if God loves me, where was he when this happened? And about 1989 or 90, we heard rumors that you could ask you could ask God that question. <laughs> and so we started trying it. Um, I didn't have access to all the inner healing material that probably wasn't even out there yet, or if it was, I didn't know of it. So we literally just started experimenting on this. And so, I mean, kids dying of anorexia or, you know, suicidal or, and, and usually initially at least connected to sexual assault. So we would just ask them, okay, I say, I, I'd say, uh, what happened to you? They tell me their story. I'd say, no, let's let's ask Jesus. You know, okay, where were you? And so, time and time again, well, every time, <laughs> people, whether they were from a Christian background or not, they would experience Christ entering into those traumatic memories and beginning to remove the the toxic lies about themselves and about God and beginning to lift the burdens of guilt or grief or shame or whatever it was they were carrying. And um, I often say it's not that he goes back in time, those events are done and gone, but the memory is a room in your heart and Christ wants access to those messy places to bring in light and healing. And um, we tested it by the fruit. And what we were hearing, even from the kids who were seeing therapists who didn't know Christ or clinical psychologists and so on, they're saying, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. It's working. And, and we just saw radical transformation, including like dramatic, even physical transformation. And eventually we realized, why are we just doing this with like sexual assault? We could do this on anything, <laughs> you know, and not that it's a silver bullet, but inviting Christ into every closet of your heart actually is powerful and transformative. And it's a, it's a mystery, but I'm, I've just seen such good fruit from it. How, how long ago was that? 18? Wow, we're talking, uh, we, I'm doing this almost 30 years. When we got to the to Freshwind Church, that's when we, we weren't expecting it. We, we prayed, we, we said, Lord, where do you want us to start in terms of outreach? Or it's like, justify another church. This makes no sense to us. <laughs> And what we, in listening together as a leadership team, uh, Sue West first heard in her heart and shared it with us, uh, start a home group with people in the, in the care home. And she happened to work in one of these care homes with people with very severe disabilities in full-time care. And then they would bring them to church on the Sunday. And when they would begin to act out, you know, let's say if they had autism or or a grand mal seizure, or wh whatever would happen in the service, we would say, what if that's where the kingdom of God is right now, rather than on the stage? So we'd interrupt the service, 
well, we wouldn't interrupt the service. We would end my interruption to get to the point. And that was we'd gather around and love and pray for these folks. And, and we began to see that they have fully functional spirits regardless of their physical or mental capacities. And so, so very quickly, we realized these are not our target group. These are pillars in our church who've come to mentor us in what Jesus is like. And they, be, you know, people with Down syndrome and, and all kinds of a, a spectrum challenges, people in their wheelchairs and, and so on, uh, with very childlike uh, levels of comprehension were on our worship team. They were, they would serve in the communion. They would do the child dedications. They like, we we tried to make them as, as much a part of the center of things as we could and to receive from them. So from there just grew out everything else. Right. So then the poor start coming, the addicts start coming because they'd go, well, if, if they're like this with these folks, they're not going to judge me. And so that's where, that's where that took off. What that taught you, I think that where you ended your list of questions there was, okay, so what, what did this teach us about people and about, about Christ? And I, I think it, it taught us that no matter how broken somebody is, the Lord wants to participate in their lives and, and actually that they are not snow-covered dung, as one Lutheran <laughs> theologian, maybe Luther even said, but rather that these, every one of us is a diamond. And um, yes, the life in this world has tarnished the diamond and he's restoring the likeness to draw out the beauty of the diamond again and we saw that with all, all of these folks and then and then also like i've do, i've done like i don't know 12 years of theological education but i can tell you like 95 or 98 percent of what i know about god is just watching him in action in these inner healing sessions and with the people on the margins in our churches as, as that i just i see no I don't, there's not any element of retribution in the nature of God. And what do you know? The Orthodox Church has taught us that from the beginning. When you were talking about inner healing, you were talking about, you know, sensing the direction or God speaking or shining light through the lies that we believe, things of that nature. In your powerful book, Can You Hear Me? Tuning into God, the God who speaks, you make a compelling case that hearing from God is to be a normal part of a Christ follower's life. What do you think keeps us from sensing the voice of God in our lives? I think the biggest thing about that is we don't count stuff <laughs> because we're waiting for the voice of God to either be grandiose and weird, like a booming echoey thing that you identify almost like an external audible voice and go, oh, that's God. Like, so thus says the Lord, 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 you know, <laughs> and then, but then if it is weird, then you go, well, that's weird. And so that can't be God. So if it's not weird, it's not God. And if it is weird, it's not God. So we just negate everything rather than thinking about all the all the normal ways that God communicates as a shepherd who's promised to guide us and counsel us. And so when I say normal ways, at the end of chapter one in Can You Hear Me, I just have a list. I'm like, have you ever have you ever sensed God speaking to you through the scriptures? And we're like, well, I, I read the scriptures. <laughs> and okay. Did they ever speak to your heart? Did the scriptures speak to your heart? Okay, yeah, they, they do. Okay, well, that counts. When you're praying, do you ever feel a burden that a burden for somebody and think, I want to pray for that person because I'm feeling compassion? Like, and they're like, well, yeah. Like, well, that counts. Have you ever felt like God has spoken to you through a friend or a pastor or a teacher where it's like you found direction in your life through a third party? Yes. Well, that counts. And so I just go through all these things that we don't normally count. And we're like Elijah. We're waiting for the earthquake and the fire and, and all of that. And and then he comes, the still small voice inside is often, I call them God thoughts. It's just thoughts that are truth and love. I'm like, well, that was me. Oh, Okay. <laughs> Or, or was it Christ in you? And does it matter? You know, so if, if, if the thoughts that are coming through me are true and, and they're beautiful and they're love, whether I attribute those to myself or to Christ, well, I don't want to give myself too much credit, but I also don't want to pull the God card. So I'm like, well, whatever that was, let's go with it. And so humbly, hypothetically saying, well, I had this thought and perhaps Christ is in me and is part of my thought life. And so what we noticed was by dialing down the rhetoric around it being a thus says the Lord, we radically increased the amount of what we saw we'd call maybe prophetic activity because it took all this pressure and performance off. I love the concept you present in your book. We're, we're not, it's not that we're not hearing or sensing God. It's that we just haven't recognized it for what it is. And that, that's so powerful yeah. and it unlocks so many other things because so many of us for so long 
had those feelings and had those thoughts about, uh, let's say, eternal conscious torment. We weren't easy. We, we, it just didn't sit easy with us. It didn't feel right. And then your book, Her Gates Will Never Be Shut, comes along. And it's incredibly formative for so many of us undergoing a restoration of faith. And when we read uh, what you and others have written about the reality of words like Gehenna and Sheol, Hades, many of us came to lose our fear of eternal conscious torment in the hell of our upbringing. A common frustrating response when we start talking about this newfound freedom with others is something along the lines of, well, what's the point of even preaching the gospel if nobody spends eternity in hell? Or why even follow Jesus at all if hell isn't what we thought it was? Good Lord. (laughs) Yeah, that's so frustrating. And so my response to that is like, I don't need to threaten people with a forthcoming torment by a divine torture. They're already experiencing hell on earth in many ways. And I can just ask them, what is it? Like the human condition is pretty rough for people. I suppose um, some of us have the privilege of living in, you know, upper middle class suburbs. But for the most part, even there, you know, we just run into people who are, they're broken. They need help now. And I I introduce them to Christ because he's the best thing that I've ever, you know, that's ever happened to me. And I see him transform people from the inside out over and over and over and actually change things in in people's hearts and their minds and, and, and bring them to peace and joy. Like, if there's no hell, would we still want to know this person? If you need hell <laughs> to be a Christian, maybe you've not met him. I uh, like this. This is really a concern for me because when you've got nuns and duns leaving the church and they're like, well, I left the church and now I don't follow Jesus either. A lot don't. Like, what does this say about the church? Did, was it not a venue where you met our Lord Jesus Christ? Or was it simply a place where you were indoctrinated into something that would make you afraid to leave until you weren't? To me, it's absolutely insane and it's troubling. I think somebody, I don't remember who it is now, maybe it was Rohr, you know, he's like, if there's a future for Christianity, it'll have to include mysticism. That is a direct experience of God and Christ in us. Because apart from an experience of Christ, it's like, well, what do we mean we know him? I said a prayer one time, I read a book, I signed on a dotted line, that's not knowing him. So all of a sudden, when Christ becomes real to us, and we experience Christ in the in the messiness of our lives, well, the hell things kind of, that's another matter. <laughs> yeah, so thanks for pitching the book there, because I, I, I do think we need to take the scriptures very seriously. And in fact, I'm not playing fast and loose with them. I think I think there's a kind of traditional infernalism that was incredibly sloppy. And we need to read the Bible more carefully and see what it actually says and how the early church understood it, who gathered this book for us. How did the early church understand the gospel? Well, I'd start with this, that the gospel to the early church was the story. They trusted the story. It's an amazing supernatural story. So when they would speak of the gospel, uh, there's two things that would happen. One is the, the very earliest use of that term. You'll, you'll see it sort of like the gospel in Paul is summarized at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15. And it's, so it's this received story. Here's what we received. That God sent his son, you know, and here's Christ. And, and, and Christ lived and he died and he rose again. And, and through his death and resurrection, he's restoring all things. And, and so become part of that, respond to that. There's a summons to enjoy the inheritance of what he did. And so it's sort of like this summary of the story and the implications or the benefits of the story. Very early on, though, in the second century, then they'll also just equate the gospel with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So again, it's the story. Here's We're going to read the gospel today. And then you would read from the four gospels. And um, unfortunately, like later on, we, well, let me add one more thing. And then by the, so the, by the time you're in the fourth century, they're saying, we, we need to come together on this. What is it we believe? What have we received? What is this gospel? And so they summarize it beautifully in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And these, again, these are summaries. They're not composing doctrine. They're remembering the faith once delivered. So through these summaries that you get in the New Testament, the preaching of the gospel in the book of Acts, the use of the four gospels in the early church really as a catechism of what the gospel is, and then and then through these very succinct summaries in the creeds, I, I think that's that would that would be how we understood 
the gospel. In your most recent book, A More Christlike God, A More Beautiful Gospel, you describe a God of infinite love and beauty who keeps no record of wrongs and loves us without condition. Why do you think it's so hard for us to accept the idea of a God completely void of transactionalism? You know, I used to think that the problem there was just indoctrination by the reformers who had a very legalistic mindset or a juridical kind of courtroom metaphor. I still think that's deeply problematic, but it's no, it's not the problem. It's an expression of the problem. They, they create a transactional doctrine that basically affirms what we inf- wrongly inferred in the fall. So I'm going to go all the way back. The bottom line is we have... We have this deep-rooted shame that happens from lies we believe um, from that archetypal fall in the Garden of Eden. And I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the very moment that we stumble. I'm Adam. I'm Eve. So, so we're going to take it like this parable of, of all humanity. Adam is humanity. And what happens is, is when we turn from the light, when we turn from willing surrender to the love of God, we turn from that. And into self-will and sort of this autonomy of I, I will become God myself. I will do this thing. Somehow our eyes are opened uh, in, a, in a negative way where it's, it's a distortion, but we, we enter the world of shame. So it's like when you turn from the light, you turn and turn towards self-will, you, you will experience a kind of shame rush into that that makes you think that you need to hide from God. Um, and so I'm going to go and I'm going to cover my nakedness. Uh, you, you, you're not vulnerable. What is it that made them rush away? They should have been rushing to God for help. Well, it's their shame that did it. Now, let's say I'm experiencing this shame and, and I, I'm undergoing it as a, as a torment to me because my conscience is accusing me and so on. If I don't simply run home to the father's house, I will begin to try to construct a way, my own way back there. So I'm still in the fall then of self-will and autonomy, but now I'm trying to reconcile with God on my terms. And I think that's where transactionalism comes in and the whole sacrificial system. And it's like, okay, he's mad at me. He doesn't love me anymore. What can I do to make this right? Well, I can offer sacrifices. I can appease his anger. I can, uh, you know, and so on. And so, yeah, I, that's where I think it comes back to. It's, and, and then, of all things, we create an entire Christian theology and stream of Christianity that absolutely buys into the lie of our separation, buys into the, the lies of being shrouded in shame and needing to create a transaction, and then even projecting that transactionalism onto what Christ did for us, rather than seeing God in Christ reconciling the world to himself through the preaching of forgiveness. You know, he, he's... It's just so ungraced to have transaction in it, but I think that's the fruit of shame. Absolutely. Uh, As we spoke earlier, uh, before we went on the air, I mentioned to you that we got some questions from social media listeners uh, last night, and you were kind enough to go through and respond to some of those, but I wanted to ask some of them on the air. I want to give equal time to the listeners uh, here today. So uh, is it okay if I just ask you a few of those questions now? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Michael McCoolye asks, are we born with a sin nature? Whoa. I missed that one. Let me think about that. Are we born with a sin nature? Oh, what's that even mean? I think we uh, we developed this idea of sin nature. It, it, sometimes it's it's how we've translated the word for flesh. Here's maybe the question. I won't answer it directly. We're we're born with a human nature that's fallen. I have a human nature and it's fallen. Well, what's fallen mean? Depends who you ask. So in the West, you end up getting this idea of original sin from Augustine, where the idea is you are born under the curse and with the guilt of Adam's sin. You've in actually inherited the guilt of Adam from birth. And so in that sense, then the language of sin nature, almost like you, you, you're you born condemned for the sins of Adam as if you sin. And, and I think that's based in Augustine's mistranslation of a, of a verse in Romans 5. And uh, you can look up David Bentley Hart, Romans 5, and he'll take you through that. In the Eastern Church, we would say, no, we don't believe in that in original sin in that sense of inherited guilt at all. And you didn't receive a sin nature in that sense. What we did inherit from birth was... Uh, mortality. The wages of sin is death, so the human race is is subject to mortality until, through Christ reopening paradise to us, we can eat of the tree of life again, which is him, which is the cross. And so we solve the problem of mortality. 
we still go through the door of death, but death has been completely renovated into a doorway. It's not a destination anymore. It's a doorway back into eternal life. And Christ has opened that door. And so by grace, Christ heals what was broken in our humanity. So really, we have, I don't think about a sin nature or whatever. I think about a human nature and the condition, the human condition. Do we have a problem? Absolutely. (laughs) But is a baby born condemned before God? Of course not. Has a baby inherited death from its parents? Yep. And, and that death will, will manifest in our lives, our death anxiety, living before death in, in, in mortal bodies, in a diseased world. We're going to react eventually and, and sort of reenact the fall ourselves. But Jeremiah is super clear. It's on this in, in the Old Testament. He says, you don't use this proverb that our fathers ate sour grapes and our teeth are set on edge. You die for your own sins. You know, your own sins kill you. And, and by the way, God doesn't kill you. <laughs> Your sins kill you. But we seem to have this gen- generational death thing that Christ has come to solve. So that's a bit complex. But again, no, we didn't inherit Adam's guilt. Yes, we did inherit a death problem. And yes, Christ has come to solve that death problem by transforming death into this doorway. Is that, do you think that covers it? Absolutely. Arthur Freimeyer Jr. asks a similar question that I think uh, is a good segue to your previous answer. If Jesus is our Savior, what does he save us from? Yeah, good. So there was, I mean, I think behind that question, too, is there, there's this other lurking thing from Western Reformed theology that, that Jesus has to save you from God. <laughs> and it's like, wait a minute, that's not right. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting our sins against us. So it's not that. So then what is it? And so uh, typically I'll say uh, he saves us from Satan, sin, and death. And then how does he do so? Well, at the cross, uh, in the Gospel of John, he says, of the devil, he says, now the prince of this world is driven out. And so I don't know how that connects with some of the other talk of the devil and Satan in the New Testament. But if you think in terms of, of the power, the power of whatever the enemy is, this phenomenon of evil. It, it's lost its power over you through the death of Christ because the power it had over you was death. And, the, and so now Hebrews 2 says, and so it's through Christ taking on humanity and experiencing death with us that, that he breaks the power of death and the fear of death through which the, Satan held us in bondage all of our lives. So somehow the resurrection is a huge, is the solution to death and the devil. That's a conquered foe. And then his, the, we're saved from sin, and not just like saved from the penalty of sin, which is death, but Christ is about saving us from sin itself. And so, first of all, he forgives us for it, but also I think he's in the business of rescuing us from our bondage to it. For example, I've said this before, it's, I mean, it's really lovely that God forgives a meth addict, <laughs> but like we need healing too. We, we, we need healing from our addiction, and, and, we, and so... George MacDonald, uh, he was a good example of, of this, where he's like, he's, God is way more thorough with sin than, than only forgiveness, although it starts there. You've already been forgiven, but now also he's going to start doing the rehabilitation work, and he won't let anything enter the kingdom of heaven unrehabilitated. So we've got a bit of a journey to do in this detox and rehab from the, my, my slavery, which apparently is still active in my life. So I, I'm... I'm walking with him on that. Andrew Parks asked, what do you think about interfaith communication and how do your thoughts affect your perception of the Great Commission? Yeah, good question. Um, So I have two books coming out probably this fall, A More Christ-like Way, but I've also got another little book that I'm hoping will be out before Christmas called In. And that book's going to be answer this question. And I'm using for Cornelius conversion as a as an example and and that is that I'll start with the story so in the story of Cornelius prior to faith in Christ God himself tells Peter he's already made Cornelius clean he's already acceptable to him that he's seen his almsgiving and his good works and he's heard his prayers so and then he begins to speak to Cornelius through angelic visitations and words of knowledge, including addresses and names. I mean, it's amazing the amount of the validation of this non-Christian's faith practice and spiritual experiences. 
And so when he comes to visit, Peter acknowledges all of that. He doesn't negate it. He doesn't even call him to renounce it. But also, he doesn't say, well, then he doesn't need Jesus. He's already clean. He's already acceptable. He's like, you know, no, he's like, ah, he's ripe to hear the good news of Jesus. And so, uh, it, so my conclusion from that, and I think Peter's conclusion from that in Acts, is that people of good faith who seek God and want to live righteous lives ought to hear some very, very good news. And it is a unique revelation that Christ brings to the table that Cornelius hadn't had regarding Abba's all-inclusive love and the, the transforming and empowering work of the Spirit. And so, th- so even though there's such an affirmation of his pre-Christian or extra-Christian whatever faith, Cornelius undergoes a powerful experience of intimacy with God at a whole new level and the power of God at a whole new, in a whole new way. And so John 14, 6, for example, is when, when it says that no one comes to the Father, to Abba, except through me. He's not saying nobody else knows God. He's saying, by coming to me, you're going to know God as Abba. You're going to know him in, in you. You're going to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. And so John Wesley talked this way. He said, oh yeah, these other people who've sought God and prayed, they knew God and God loved them and they were acceptable before him. But what they're getting with the gospel is they're getting a revelation of this person so that they know the full inheritance of the gospel and have complete assurance in their faith about what Christ has done for all. And so as Simone Weil would say, I don't got to go out and you know give people a new religion. I, I need to go out and give them good news. Hey, I've got good news for you. If you're, if whatever religious practices you're in are causing you bondage, whether you're Muslim, Buddhist, or Christian, by the way, I've got such good news for you. You know, there's no transaction necessary. There's this grace gift of love, and you need to know He's already loves you. He's forgiven you, and He wants to know you, and to come into a deeper kind of intimacy with you. And we found that out through Jesus, and we saw it revealed through Jesus, and we saw it established through Jesus. Are you interested? And um, so that's kind of how I'm uh, handling it these days. So that book in will be out around Christmas, you think? I'm hoping, yeah, I'm hoping it'll be out before Christmas. Wonderful. I'm really looking forward to that. Now, now that I've just announced it for the very first time publicly, <laughs> I, um, I think most of it's written. I just need to do some reformatting and maybe add a, you know, preface or something. Fantastic. Listener Autumn Gurdon asks this question. Going through my own deconstruction restoration, I find it hard to imagine ever being in a place where I want to step back into an institutional church setting or claim a denomination. I know you went through your own process and ended up very involved in an Orthodox community, which was very different from your own upbringing. What are your thoughts slash encouragements on finding a new community without finding yourself in another form of religion or fundamentalism? Oh, that's such a hard and excellent question. I I guess what I what I like about the question is that she values community. She and so I would start here, you know, whatever the the, the church that Christ established, this Greek word ecclesia, it includes gathering where two or three are gathered in his name. I uh, I would say that that gathering uh, in its fullness, needs to be face to face. It needs to be fle- the word has to become flesh. And so, uh, while you can have some level of community online, for example, unless you can smell the person, you don't have the fullness <laughs> of uh, 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 of that fellowship. Right. And it's not just two or three Christians hanging out for a beer. It's in his name. And so what does in his name include? And I think we could be very, it can include it can include a lot. It can be very eclectic. I'm in a 12-step group that is explicitly not Christian, but where we can name Christ, individuals in it can name Christ as their higher power. And I'm I'm like, wow, this is this is some of the best community I've been part of where God is proclaimed as loving, caring, and forgiving. And some some understand that to be Christ, and and some are still thinking about that. But there's also this thing that ecclesia is actually an Old Testament Septuagint word that began on Mount Horeb with the giving of the covenant. So I want to say in his name, I'm really, the fullness of it will be a, a, where you're gathering around covenant. And I'm thinking of the Eucharist now, that I don't feel like I've experienced the fullness of of what 
Christ established as his community, as his covenant community, uh, unless I'm partaking with other believers in the new covenant of his blood. So for, for me, I, I kind of feel a bit ripped off when I go to church and there's not communion because that communion is with God and with others. Well, so that's kind of the easy part. <laughs> I can be really inclusive about what community looks like as long as it's a gathering in his name around the new covenant. But on the other hand, it's a valid question. Some people have been so spiritually abused and worse, you know, in the context of, I'm going to say organized, I'll start this way, of organized religion, that they're like, how could I ever go back to that? I'm like, well, or by, by hierarchy. <laughs> so what I'll often say is, if you think organized religion is toxic, you should watch out for disorganized religion. If you think hierarchy is toxic, um, watch your back for anarchy, because that's not better. Um, so the question is, you know, where can I where can I find healthy fellowship where I'm not going to be burned again? And, you know, frankly, I've met people who've gone through five, six burnings, and they're like, I just can't go back. And I want them to know I get it. I really get it. I don't, I don't judge you. I don't blame you. I don't, you know, whatever. But then again, and this, I learned from David Hayward on this, the naked pastor. He's brilliant. He's a friend of mine. He said um, they used to talk about their online community as a safe place. And he's like, that's really a misnomer. <laughs> if, you're, if you want to be a safe place, why do you want to be a safe place? Well, so broken people could come. Guess what happens when you have a community of broken people? It's not going to be a safe place. It's going to be messy, messy, messy. And so they started, they changed their lingo. And I, I love this. I've advised other churches to do this is call it a healthy place. And that is that when broken and messy people come together, they will be triggered and they will misbehave and there will be conflict. And we will have healthy processes for working through that. If you're looking for, for community, uh, don't look for, uh, you know, a community where everybody is squeaky clean. That's just a big fat lie. But where perhaps unhealthy people are walking in a community of healthy processes that are emphasize reconciliation and accountability and restoration and forgiveness and all of that kind of thing. I'll add one more thing, too, is that my my godfather david goa he 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 identifies this as a real problem people who left church because they are upset about something may think that their best hope is to find a fraternity of sameness and like-minded people and i'm telling you that <laughs> that doesn't last cuz then what you've done is you've made agreement a foundation for your community and you won't even be able to hold a home group together but if you think of it as a family where you are stuck together with unlike-minded unlike brothers and sisters, where the person across the room may actually believe the very opposite of you in every way, but you share the human condition and you share the one medicine, which is, which is Christ, then, then you won't have an expectation of sameness that leads to a blow up. Right. You, you found a home in the Orthodox Church, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone at the monastery or the Orthodox Church around the world uh, lines up perfectly with the theology you believe today. Is that correct? Oh, uh, yeah, that'd be correct for sure. We have, we're very eclectic. So, you know, I think there's uh, 350 million of us. <laughs> so you're going to have the full range of progressive to uh, pr pr progressive to conservative, to fundamentalist, you're going to have people who are, and that's what I like about the Orthodox Church, we understand that it's not about sameness. So you can be a universalist like David Bentley Hart or Gregory of Nyssa, or you can be a fundamentalist who preaches, who thinks, you know, believes in hellfire and brimstone. Okay, but you know what? You're my brother or sister. We see this differently. Now let's go to confession and, and uh, let go of our malice, and let's go to communion and receive the fruit of the tree of life. You know, and then there's, there's things at large where how do I live as an egalitarian in a church where it's male-only priesthood? It's like, well, I struggle with that. I lament that. And in fact, I, I can't change that. But what I can do is I can make, I can decide for myself. And so, you know, the thing that I hinted at online last night is what do I want to say about seeing my wife in ministry? I believe that women should not have a glass ceiling in the church. And until, let's say, the Orthodox Church changes that, it won't be in my lifetime. 
So what can I do? Just leave? It's like, no, I can't. I need the therapy. I need the theology. I need, but what I, what I can do is say, I, I will, I've decided not to rise higher than a woman can. That's just, that's my conviction. Uh, at one time I thought I'd be a priest or a deacon. I'm like, I can't do that. They don't, they, they don't want me to anyway. <laughs> but, and so we're, agree, we agree <laughs> um, that I will not, I will not be what a woman cannot be in, in, in our church. And, and that's one of the, so that's one area of disagreement I have with them. I can't change closed communion in the Orthodox church. I understand why they do it. I think it's wrong. I can't change that. What I can do is, is be in real fellowship, real unity with people across the board. I'm unsatisfied with how churches, <laughs> but I don't actually see a plan B in, in Christ's mind. And we can't put the baby back in the womb. You know, my mentor, Ron Dart, says this. It's like, we want to go back to the early church. Is it? Guess what? It was a baby. And what are we going to do? Start chopping off limbs of the church to fit this dysfunctional adult back in a womb? It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. We've been thrown into something, and how will, how will we live in this game of thrownness? Huh? Huh? Get it? <laughs> <laughs> Brad, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, I know I told you we'd keep it to an hour, so I want to be respectful of that. But you've talked about a couple of projects you have coming out later this year. Do you have other projects in the works right now? Uh, let me think about this. So in September, A More Christ-Like Way is coming out. That's going to be the sequel to A More Christ-Like God. That's that's almost like a for sure by September. Okay. Then, as I said, I'm trying to get this this book in. And the sub working subtitle is Christ's Unique Incarnation or Revelation of God's All-Inclusive Love. And so that, that should be out. Um, next year... I'm hoping to release a short story, and it's possible that I'm co-writing it with Paul Young, and that's that's about a pastor in a psych ward, which will be an exaggerated version of a conflation of several characters in my personality and in others. And you know that'll be a really short little booklet, maybe 60 pages, but it should be it's it's my first work of fiction. I don't think I'll be done by the end of next year, but we're hoping to have a third book out called A More Christ-like Word. A lot of that is written also, but and that's going to be talking about how how Jesus Christ is the Word, and then we take that the living Word of Christ to the Scriptures a, as our hermeneutic. And so I'm sort of just going to include a bunch of essays and articles I've been working on uh, around Scripture and a Christ-like Word would look like. So we'll have a trilogy eventually. Wonderful. Well, I'm really looking forward to all of those uh, publications being released, and I want to thank you for your work for all of the podcast interviews that you've done. I've, everyone that I've listened to has helped me tremendously. Uh, Brad, I honestly believe that there's a very good chance that I, I would not be considering myself a Christ follower at all if it weren't for your work. If I hadn't stumbled upon the Hellbound documentary and been introduced to a God that wasn't the monster that I was preaching him to be, and even last year, uh, you and I had exchanged some messages on Facebook. We were talking about an event in Birmingham that we were trying to put together. And I was going through a great sadness in my own family and struggling with one of our ch children. And uh, you showed me great kindness and uh, even reached out and asked about that child by name. And I, I can't thank you enough for just being a person of character and integrity and for your friendship. And I'm so grateful for your work. And I'm really grateful for your time here today. Thanks a lot. And if, if, you know, as you think of it, please pray for me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, uh, um, Lord have mercy should do, but you know, whatever comes to mind. Thank you. Friends, you'll find links to all of Brad's books and to his website on the show notes for this episode. Brad, thanks again for joining us on the Messy Spirituality Podcast. My pleasure.